This is the moment we've all been waiting for. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Welcome to the Junkyard Pod, I'm Tony Pesta, and joining me today to give a final preview of the upcoming series between the Orlando Magic and Cleveland Cavaliers, we have a very special guest, Nick Padone of the Big Play Cleveland Show. Nick, thanks for joining, and let the people know where they can find you. Yeah, definitely. Th- first, thanks for having me. I, I, we've been trying to put this in motion for a while, and we finally got you on my show got me on here. So this is good. I'm glad this worked out right before the playoffs. Yeah. You could find me on the big play Cleveland show Mondays, 9 PM Eastern on YouTube, Twitter, uh, on the big play network. I also host boobies world with Daniel booby Gibson. Um, that releases kind of periodically just based off his schedule. So yeah, fo- follow the, all those on big play. Yeah, definitely. Check out Nick. Uh, puts out great content on uh, various different platforms. Uh, glad that we're finally doing this life as a a podcaster it's just it, the schedules are always mixed up i went on nick's show he's coming on mine and i've been previewing this Cavs magic series all week i'm so ready for it just to get started uh but i want to round out my discussion this this preview series that we've been doing by talking about what is at stake in this first round series for the cavaliers how much is riding on this matchup and what it could mean for the franchise moving forward uh so let's start here who on the Cavs is facing the most pressure to perform and get out of round one? Yeah, I think right now, and we talked about this on Monday, right? Like it's got to be JB Bickerstaff. I, I hate saying it because I really think JB is a one, a really good guy and two, a good NBA coach. But we, we know this, Tony, like in the NBA so many times, the guy that pulls you out of the mud oftentimes isn't the same guy that takes you to the heights that you want to go to. Now, that's not always the case, but I hope for J.B. Bickerstaff that he could get out of round one, maybe make some noise in round two and buy some people back both externally and internally within that Cavs organization. I do think there's a lot of pressure on him. Obviously, we'll talk about it later in the show that there's a lot of pressure on the players, too, um, after what happened last year. But really, I think pressure is the word for this entire Cavs organization. You know, they pushed all their chips into the center of the table in that season finale. They wanted the Orlando magic. Chris McNeil said it best on my show. You know, they wrote the script. So now you have to finish it. You know, like you set this all up the exact way that you want it. So now you got to go out there and close the deal. Um, And and that's the biggest thing for the Cavs. And I know too, like there were some people and I definitely wanted to talk about this. Like there were some people that were like saying, you know, like being upset, like, oh, the Cavs are just trying to, you know, get out of the first round. Like, is that really the goal is just a first round? And I think people need to realize, like, in the NBA, there are progressions that happen. I think in Cleveland, we were spoiled with four consecutive trips to the NBA Finals with LeBron James. We kind of lost sight how the rest of the league works in the sense of, yeah, a lot of the times your first time in the playoffs, you get punched in the mouth. Look at the New York Knicks and what happened to them, you know, with with Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks and that crazy series. And then they were able to bounce back last year, unfortunately, against our Cavs. And then look at what happened to them after that. You know, they fell apart a little bit. Same thing here. The Cavs got to get out of the first round. That is the first step for this team. And I, there's a lot of pressure on them to do just that. After that, I think they're playing with a little bit of house money because that's the biggest thing is getting out of that first round. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know everybody wants to see this process just happen overnight. I think part of the reason why people are a little more upset than usual on Cavs Twitter is because I mentioned this on uh, the last episode that I did where really we should have been at this stage last year getting out of the first round. Hey, it is what it is. They lost. It's time to move on. We are where we are. Uh, The first step is getting out of the first round. Uh, and you said it perfectly. Listen, they drew Orlando. This is what they wanted. So there's a lot of pressure on them to go out and win this series now. Uh, JB is probably facing the most pressure as far as who will face the most consequences if they don't get out of the first round. Uh, and hey, you know what? JB, earlier in the year, back in December, felt like his job was on the line. I thought he was going to be out of here any day now. But I did say if he manages to lead this team or at least play a role in having them 
survive during all those injuries, maybe he could save his job. They did more than survive. They were the yep. best team in the NBA for about a month and a half. Now, how much of that is JB? How much of it is the players? Uh, I would probably give the majority of the credit to the players, but I, I do think we should acknowledge that JB talked all summer about how he wants the team to play faster. He wants them to shoot more three-pointers. There needs to be more motion in the offense, and they have accomplished all of that. Uh, it's been shoddy throughout the year. It hasn't been perfect, but JB does did have a clear vision for this team, and he has implemented it uh, to at least the best of his ability. So I want to give credit there where it's due. Um, I do think it's going to be hard for him to save himself at this stage. Uh, he's going to have to really, really prove something. Um, and I guess if if there's any reason for optimism, he has more options now. Uh, we're going to talk about the Cavs bench later in the episode, and we're going to talk about that core four in a second here. Um, I'll mix up my answer as far as who's facing the most pressure, just to be contrarian. Uh, and I'll go Donovan Mitchell yeah. because – I think part of what's lost in this discussion sometimes is that Mitchell is facing just as much pressure as anyone else to get out of this first round. He has had a very mixed playoff resume. He was great uh, earlier in his career. He's had about two years now where he just hasn't really, he's just come up a little short. And so Mitchell is absolutely feeling that pressure. He's capable of leading a team out of the first round. And this is not to say that Orlando is a slouch by any means, but they are a team that someone like Donovan Mitchell can carry you uh, over them. Even if the rest of the Cavs are struggling, Donovan Mitchell is a player capable of beating a team like Orlando in the first round. So I think it's time to prove it. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. And I know for a fact, you know, he puts a lot of the blame for what happened last year against the Knicks on himself. Um, rightfully so. And I think that's what a leader of a basketball team does. Um, but it's time it's time to bounce back, like you said. And I know there's a lot to be said of what's going to happen this offseason, right? And a lot of it depends and hangs in the balance of what happens in this first round. But for Donovan especially, I think the Cavs and Mitchell need to prove it to one another. You know, the Cavs need to prove to Mitchell that they could be serious and contend. That's with the guys on the roster rising to the occasion, helping them out a little bit, and then solving the whatever is the, the situation with the head coach, whether they keep JB, whether they move on from him, you know, whether JB rises to the moment or he doesn't, is to be seen. But for Mitchell... I think he needs to prove to the Cavs a little bit that this is the superstar that they really want to latch their wagon to. And I think they're, that he is right now. You know, I'm definitely not saying that, you know, the Cavs are thinking about getting rid of Donovan Mitchell. But if your superstar player that you traded all the first round picks for, Colin Sexton, Laurie Markinen, gets bounced twice in the first round, and that was the move that was supposed to expedite things for this organization. I think there becomes a, a little bit more questioning of the, if this is the guy that you really want to build everything around and the guy that you really want calling the shots within the organization. So I, I'm, I'm completely in lock, lockstep with you. Um, the, the, the Cavs and Mitchell have a lot to prove to each other in this playoffs. I agree. And at the very least there, like it makes things more complicated for Mitchell if he does underperform. Yeah. And the Cavs get bounced because it's like, well, what are you going to demand a trade now? Who do you have to blame? And I think so much of this, I feel like Mitchell wrongly gets the reputation that a lot of guys like Tyree, Kevin Durant, James Harden, or where the disgruntled star, the frustrated yeah. star, for whatever reason, Mitchell gets that reputation when he's never been that. Even in Utah, he didn't show that uh, type of personality. This is a guy who I think just wants to win basketball. I think he holds himself to the highest standard and, like you said, it's time for the Cavs and Mitchell to prove some things to each other. Uh, now let's switch gears and talk about that core four of Mitchell, Mobley, Allen, and Garland. And specifically, is this postseason going to be make or break for that group? Could we see either the front court or back court get split up this summer, depending on how the playoffs go? Uh, where do you stand on the core four? You know, it feels like it's possible that if things don't go the Cavs way, that something gets shaken up this offseason. I don't know that that's the right move. I know a lot of people earlier in the year were pointing fingers in, in a, two different directions. One direction at Darius Garland and then a little bit from last season to at Evan Mobley. You know, that maybe he hasn't developed the same way that we thought that he would. And I implored people at the time. Hey, look up NBA trades that have happened in the last 10 years and show me 
one time were NBA All-Star or a player that shows All-Star promise. DG's been an All-Star. Evan Mobley shows promise in the sense that he could legitimately be a defensive player of the year candidate at some point in his career. And obviously the offense needs to continue to develop. I think it has a lot this year. I get that it's not on schedule to what some people really thought, you know, lofty expectations for him, whatever. Those guys don't get traded, though. Like, teams aren't just giving up on guys before they're 25 years old, before they've really reached their peak. So I think if they shake anything up, it would probably be Mitchell or Allen just because those dudes are a little bit older. We kind of know what they both are. I just... It, it feels like something's going to happen, but I really don't want it to. I think these four dudes are, are the right pieces together, and you got to just find maybe the coach that makes it work, the role players that make it work. I know a lot of us were excited about Max Struess, and he has been good at times, but he's also been bad at times. We saw a Sam Merrill come in and play the same role, but cheaper and maybe even a little bit better <laughs> throughout times in the season. And I think that frustrated a lot of people. So I want to see this all work. I want to close my eyes and have this be kumbaya. And we sweep the Orlando Magic and then give Boston a hell of a series and maybe even advance after that. Um, because I just don't think teams really give up on these type of blue chip young players before they reach 25 years old. Yeah, no, it's uh, especially not players like Mobley and Garland who have proven that they have some talent. Uh, yeah. When you're thinking of like Anthony Bennett, it's like, yeah. okay, sure. You can get rid of that guy at a certain point. But yeah, I, you know, I said at the beginning of the year that one of my biggest concerns is that something goes wrong and they have to blow this team up uh, mm. for better or worse, because I do like this core four. I know everyone has their gripe with the front court or the back court, whether it's, you know, the two bigs and the no spacing thing uh, gripes about the two undersized guards, but they've proven throughout the last two years for stretches that it can all work and it can all yeah. make sense. Um, obviously they have to prove it on the big stage. That's where we are now. Uh, if it goes wrong, I think, again, whether it's the right decision or not, we'll be talking about it for a long time, probably. We'll see some changes uh, as small as coaching or as big as splitting up one of those duos, maybe even splitting up both of them. Uh, the one thing that I want to say, the decision to trade for Donovan Mitchell, a lot of people consider that the all-in move, and it certainly was a move to speed up the timeline. Yeah. I don't think it accelerated the timeline as quickly as we kind of think uh, Mitchell is 27 years old. He is very much it right in the middle of his prime. If you look at the different iterations of Boston and Denver, how long it took them to get to where they are. You mentioned New York is a great example, getting bounced by Atlanta and then coming back and, and being the team that we know now, even Phoenix, the Clippers, the heat, the Milwaukee bucks, like this stuff takes time. There's trials and tribulations. You're going to have ups and downs that you can't account for. How many times did Milwaukee, uh, get frustrated in the playoffs and they could yep. have easily switched things up, but they stuck to it. Same with Denver, same with Boston. So uh, this is, you can't skip steps in the NBA. Something that I keep saying, this is just part of the process. Uh, and hopefully they take some steps forward this year, because that's what you need to see at this point. They're facing immense pressure, uh, but I don't think it's quite do or die just yet. Even if that might be the end decision that gets made by the front office. Exactly. And and I guess that's welcome to life in sports. Welcome to life in Cleveland sports. You know, they expect, I think fan, both fans and the organization, you know, expected the Donovan Mitchell trade not to be an all in move like NBA championship or bust, but just something that really sped the process along. And we know here in Cleveland, especially, you know, we spend so much time in this studio talking about the Browns right here steps away from us. Like when things don't get right, people are looking to just blow it up um, because that's that's life. You know, when, when you make a big move and you, you go in for something that you want to pay dividends and it doesn't work out, you got to pivot quickly. So I, I get it if the Cavs do decide to do that, you know, depending on how this playoffs go. But I really want to see them stay patient, keep the four, the core four intact, because I think all of these dudes in their own right and together have proven that this could all work out. And it, like you said, man, you got to just be patient with it, which that and, sucks. You know, I, I get people don't want to <laughs> people don't want to hear that, but it's got to happen. Definitely. And, you know, Kobe Altman has been very patient the last few years. I mean, first off, let's be clear. Swinging for Donovan Mitchell was a big move. Yeah. Uh, down, like Kobe Altman has shown that he will make moves when he feels the time is necessary. He traded half the damn team in 2018 yep. at the deadline. <laughs> so 
Uh, I'm glad that he stayed patient to give us one final look at this core, potentially a final look at this core, and see what they're made of. Uh, that brings us to our final topic here, and it's all about the Cavalier bench, because whether or not the core gets split up, if this first round series doesn't go well, some type of changes are happening to the roster, and it could be as far as retooling the bench. Now, the Cavs bench last year was one of their downfalls in the playoffs. This time around, things are different. Uh, they have improved their bench. They have more options, I would say. But how much do you trust the Cavaliers' second unit? I'll say this. I think we find out very, very early in this series <laughs> against Orlando. Um, and we, you know, we talked about Karis Levert on Monday on, on our show, Tony. Like, hmm. if if we could get a good Karis Levert in this series, I, that changes everything, you know, because that's a guy that could come off the bench and, and give you, you know, give Orlando buckets, give them problems, you know, 14, 15 points off that Cavalier bench. That's a lot to handle, especially when you have, you know, George Niang shooting the three and being physical on the inside. Uh, obviously, um, that's the, that's going to be my biggest thing. I, I really think, and I like I said too. I think I think we find out really early, like like within the first game or that two games. Game. You yeah. know what what <laughs> what this bench group is really going to give you, and I think too we'll find out more importantly. What's JB going to do? How deep is he going to go? You know, are we going to see Sam Merrill if he's healthy? I think that would excite a lot of people. I don't necessarily know that it's going to happen. You know, how long is the leash on somebody like Levert if he starts turning the ball over and kicking the ball off his foot, you know, doing that whole act that we've seen him do before? That I think that's all, you know, just to be seen how long the leash is on guys and how deep in the bag JB wants to go. Tristan Thompson, you know, if you really get your back up against the wall and Mo Wagner is rebounding the becoming a rebound machine and you need somebody to scrap it up, I'm not saying for even 10 minutes, you know, just to put put them in there and change up the flow of the game. Yeah, like, why is, not? The, is that a chip that JB will play? You know, I, I think we find that out kind of early in the series of what this bench group is going to give the Cavs. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The highs and lows of Karis LeVert are just, they're painful sometimes. They're either painful or they're the greatest thing you've yeah, ever seen. It, sometimes it's just awesome, you know, like, yeah. like this guy, because he's another guy, like, seriously, like, I feel like Karis LeVert, on his best day. This might be a hot take. Karis LeVert on his best day against Orlando in a game that they're not playing that well, he could win that game, you know, single-handedly, oh, yeah. like what we were yeah. talking about Donovan Mitchell. But he needs to be that guy. Like, he can't just turn into a shell of himself and start turning the ball over like crazy because when that starts to happen, then the rest of it all evades him too. So, like, he needs to be careful with the ball and deliberate with what he does out there because – when things start going helter skelter, it's like he snowballs. I feel like. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the it's the reverse avalanche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whenever whenever Karis isn't playing well, it's just the decisions get worse and worse. The defense falls apart. But when he is playing well, I mean, we saw it against Boston. I think last year, the forty one points, step back threes. He's a great playmaker. Uh, if he is on, that would really really help this team. Uh, like you said, if he is not on, I think we probably will be able to tell right away. Uh, as for the rest of the bench, I think a Coro could be an X factor. If he's able to stay on the floor, that would help them a lot defensively. If he's able to knock down threes and just look like a functional member of the offense. Yep. George Niang is the guy that I'm most worried about. He could help a lot if he's knocking down threes yep. uh, just by space on the floor and bringing those Orlando rim protectors out. But he could also tank a game very fast. Um, I've been worried about Niang's potential spot in the playoff rotation all year. You looked at his time in Philly last year, he was pulled off the floor pretty quickly. And I'm just worried that having him out there when it's maybe obvious that he might not be able to last could end up tanking a game similar to the way Ricky Rubio a year ago tanked, I think, game two, where it's like we probably knew Rubio shouldn't have been out there, but they yep. gave him the minutes anyway, and they just got slaughtered in those minutes. And it was like, it was, oh no, it wasn't game two, it would have been game three, I think, because they won game two. Yeah, uh, it was, it was one of the next games. Yeah, yeah. It was in New York. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it kind and it of couldn't to recover. That point, we knew right away, you know, that game got out of hand really early at Madison Square Garden that the Knicks were going to run away with that one. And Niang is an interesting guy because that's a dude that I, I'm with you, you know, probably shouldn't have the longest leash in a playoff series, but 
is somebody that JB Bickerstaff continually has enlisted a ton he loves of him. trust in and a ton of minutes. And I like him in the sense, and I think he could bring value to the mm. Cavs. If the, like what I was saying before, like Tristan, if things start getting chippy, I do like Niang out there to be a little bit of a tone setter. But I think that that needs to you need to play that role properly. You know, that that's a role that you come in and you play just a few minutes. You go out there and maybe have a couple really hard fouls, make a couple threes, and then everybody loves you and a, you're a Cleveland hero. On the inverse, I don't want to see him playing almost 20 minutes, having a bunch of bricks and not playing a whole lot of defense because that doesn't really bring the same kind of value. I will say yeah. that we we have some very fun um, content coming uh, l- later today and before game one tips tomorrow. I believe with with George, he I, I love that dude. He's he's a lot of fun, but it, we oh, we he, need he him to be like on on Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, he I think uh, part of the reason why I'm more worried in this is just because Dean Wade might not be available to play those minutes in case dude, the knee minutes I don't know. go well. It's it's such an unfortunate time for Wade to be hurt. Uh, who knows, though? The, the Cavs have been so secretive with this injury. Maybe he's back earlier in the series. We have no idea. Yeah. Uh, same with Sam Merrill, who I believe has been practicing. Uh, he'll probably be available. Will he get out there? That's up to JB. Same thing with Marcus Morris, Tristan Thompson. These are all buttons that JB has the option to option to push. Uh, whether or not he does it and whether or not he does it at the right time uh, is yet to be seen. I think that is going to be one of the biggest things to focus on as far as how is JB looking in this series? Is he making the right rotations? That's that's definitely a key. Dude, there might be riots down East Ninth if if Sam Merrill doesn't check into some of these games. If they look like you know they're having a hard time spacing the floor, if there's a lack of threes going through, there the people are going to be big mad. I, I'm saying it now. You know, I think we saw Sam Merrill and what he could do against this Magic team earlier in the season. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think he went crazy in a game against yeah, Orlando yeah. earlier in the year. And I get why they want to be conservative with him. You know, he's still a really young player. He has shown so much promise. Why would you want to throw him into serious minutes in a first round playoff series and have any of that be wavered? But man, with the pressure and, you know, we, we've been talking so much about the pressure surrounding this team in round one. And with that mounting, I would just pull all the stops. And for me, that's seeing Merrill out there shooting the three ball uh, in this first round series against Orlando. Yeah, definitely. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, Merrill had one of those games against Orlando where it was, he's on the floor for three minutes and he has four three pointers. Yeah, uh, he's just an absolute human torch. Uh, and if you get one of those games, that could change a whole. Uh, if you get one of those in that series, that could change a whole game all on its own. If, and if, if Merrill doesn't play and there is riots, uh, I can assure that my co-host Jackson Flickinger will be on the front lines there. <laughs> <laughs> I love but, it. Uh, Tell him to uh, wear the body armor. I'll be out there with him. <laughs> uh, I, I'll definitely let him know. I think he's already got some things planned, I'm sure of it. Uh, so we're going to wrap up this discussion here. And now I've already planted my flag on the Cavs and Six uh, agenda, but I think I've seen you choose the Cavs in five, but let's set it in stone right here. Who do you got in round one? Yeah, yeah. I went Cavs in five. I went optimistic. I did it last year against the Knicks, and my reasoning is exactly the same, is that I believe that the Cavs are the better, more talented team up through bottom against the Orlando Magic. And that's no slight against the Magic. I think they are here to stay. I like the way that they've constructed that roster. I think they could make a couple smaller, splashy moves this offseason to kind of expedite their own process because Bancaro is a future star of this league. But we know, we saw what had happened to our Cavs last year. You know, you got to get humbled at some point. And for Orlando and their punchy, cute, little, fun TikTok song that everybody loved during the regular <laughs> season, this, this is where it happens. You know, this is where the Cavaliers flex their muscles, assert their dominance, gentlemen sweep. I think the Magic find a way to get one at, on their home court in Orlando and the Cavs finish it off right here in the friendly confines of Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Get this thing done in five games. I'm rolling with the Cavs in five. It's an optimistic prediction, but I think it could become realistic if Donovan Mitchell delivers the way that we expected him to when that Woj bomb dropped all those years ago and he uh, he came out here to Cleveland. I love the confidence, man. I'm, I'm right there with you. I do think that this could be a five-game series. Honestly, I think could be a five game series either way depending on how disastrous yeah. things go but 
I'm mainly just hedging my bet here. That's why I went Cavs in six. I learn. I'm trying to learn my lesson from last year because I was also very confident in the Knicks series. But Nick Cavs in five, Cavs in six. Uh, I could see either happening. I could see Cavs in seven. Uh, it's really yeah. this is going to be one heck of a series. I'm really looking forward to it. And you know, there you have it. That's going to do it for this episode of the Junkyard Pod. Again, thank you, Nick, for coming on and helping me cap off this week of previews. Thanks to everyone who has watched and listened along the way. Make sure you check out Nick's show. And uh, all we can do now is wait and see how things play out tomorrow. Uh, With all that being said, go Cavs. Go Cavs.